Hi, welcome to the Exploration Films podcast. I'm your host, Carl Muller. Here at Exploration Films, we offer discoveries, news, history, all through documentaries and feature films that really bring out the best in people and the best stories. Today, I'm thrilled to say we have an award-winning, Academy Award-nominated director, really a legend from South African filmmaking, Daryl Root, with us. And Daryl is the director of the new film on Exploration Films called The Furnace, a compelling drama that has really captured my attention and the attention of many here in the U.S. It's really an outstanding film, and Daryl has been the director of, as I said, over 30 films. Daryl, welcome to the Exploration Films podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Here I am in South Africa. (laughs) You are in South Africa. And I just want to give our listeners a note. uh, Coming in all the way from South Africa to the eastern part of the United States on audio is not always the best thing. So we're going to persevere and do the best we can with the audio today. But Daryl, I'm so glad you're with us and I'm so glad you're here. You are, in fact, an Oscar nominated director. Is that right? Yes, no, absolutely. Look, I mean, it's been 15 years since that nomination. Time goes so fast. Time it, goes it fast. It feels like yesterday. It was announced on CNN. I jumped through the ceiling when that day happened. It was awesome. I'm we're sure. nominated for best, film, for, for best foreign film for a film I made called Yesterday. Yeah. So that was, yeah, it was the first South African film to be nominated for an Oscar. So it was really cool, you know. And you've actually walked the red carpet then in Hollywood. I, <laughs> it's a far. I did indeed, you know. And but, you know, it's a old story. No one remembers uh, the ones that don't win, you know. So it's been, you know, we've just had a march on many times since then. I made another film that was close to being nominated. We were the official South African entry to the Oscars for a film called Little One. Mm. And that was about six years ago, you know. So we keep trying, you know. There's, there's always, you know. So you are South African. You're actually in South Africa now and you're from South Africa. Is that right? Yes, no, absolutely. You know, I did work in Hollywood for a little while. I made one movie, but it was a, quite a terrifying experience. I was very young. <laughs> when I say young, about 32. And I made a film with Patrick Swayze for Disney. And it was just a tough experience. You know, just seeing films made on that level and having to deal with all those executives. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, I, I just couldn't cope with that. So I came back to South Africa and I've made South African films ever since, you know? Well, you know, South Africa has a tremendous film industry. I don't know if many in the United States know just how committed the South African government and the South African people are to quality filmmaking. I think a lot of people would know that the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean were big movies, but if you drive past this one area of Cape Town in the Southern Cape Flats area, you see literal pirate ships down there. And that's part of the intentional investment in South Africa on movie making. Isn't that right? Yeah, well, it's a very good service industry, South Africa. We've got fantastic crews. I mean, because they're working a lot of big shows now. So their level of professionalism is high, you know. So there's a lot of big shows that still come through South Africa, which is great for the crews, you know. It's different if you're a director because you're not going to get hired to direct that film. They're bringing in their international director. So as directors, we still work at a very low level. So, for example, The Furnace is a film that costs maybe... Let's have a look there. Half a million dollars to make, not more than that, to actually make it. So, I mean, that's kind of, look, I mean, that's still money. But, yeah. And that half a million goes a long way in South Africa. But, I mean, it's very low budget compared to, I'm always constantly amazed when I'll see a film like, for example, I watched The Goldfinch a couple of nights ago, which I didn't enjoy. Mm. It cost $45 million to make. Five people talking in a room, really? I mean, that's like 90 times more than a film like The Furnace. Come yeah. on. And I think it speaks a lot to the capacities, the innovation of South Africans. In fact, I would say I would commend most of my South African friends for their level of innovation in the face of some of those less resourced opportunities. I mean, almost any, well, I say this full knowing there are huge hundred million dollar budget films that bomb completely. But if you're not a complete, you know, (laughs) ineptitude, you put a hundred million dollars in anything and you're going to do well, but 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, you can't use that as an excuse in the final analysis. Unfortunately, you do get judged against those movies. And understandably so. As a member of the audience, I'm not going to say, well, how much was the budget to that film? Oh, it's actually very good then. But that's not how it works. So no, no, even right. with your budget, you've still got to try and somehow entertain and give it some kind of rich production value, which is difficult, you know? However, yeah. uh, you know, it does reach a lot of things. And I mean, I would defy most directors in the world to try and do what we do and deliver the quality we do. It really teaches you to think. I mean, mm -hmm. The Furnace is made in three weeks. It's like crazy time to make a movie, you know? But, you know, you do it. Well, we're gonna, I really want to dive into the furnace as well, but I, that sounds very odd to say I want to dive into the furnace, but, but it's a, it was a great film. And being more or less one of these directors that is able to take smaller, independent, budgeted films and so forth and really make something of them and really make a powerful impact with films like The Furnace. What's your background? How did you get started in filmmaking? I mean, is it every uh, young South African boy's dream to grow up to be a film director nominated for an Academy Award? No, no, no. Well, when I was growing up in South Africa, there was no film industry. There was a tiny film industry. And certainly they were only making very parochial government, you know, like propaganda movies, you know, mm. for a very certain, like kind of Afrikaans films, but very limited their scope. So when I was 22, I couldn't get into film school for a lot of reasons. There was a state run film school and I didn't fit their agenda. You know, I was very yeah. outspoken. So I had to just go and make my own film. So I made a film called Place of Weeping when I was 22 that challenged the apartheid system yeah. directly from the movie. And it was a core celeb. I mean, I traveled all over the world with that film. And what it showed young emerging South African filmmakers is that you can make a film about your country and a parochial film, but that is also, it's got meaning for the rest of the world, you know, as well as local audiences. And it broke through big time. Bang, I was gone, you know? Well, you know, what's fascinating to me is many of your films really touch into that reality, the reality that you've actually lived as a South African over these last several decades coming out of the apartheid era, coming into the new South Africa. How have those experiences, you mentioned the one film, A Place of Weeping. How have some of your other films reflected some of that background for you? You know, I mean, those days it was pretty, it, well, well, I don't want to say easy because it's not fair for the guys who are on the receiving end, but you knew where you stood. So I could make films like Serafina or Cry the Beloved Country that were directly challenging the status quo and trying to provide, you know, an alternative point of view or a challenging, a contrary point of view to say, no, enough of this, we need to, ch you know, change the system, et cetera, et cetera. So you had an agenda. It was a powerful agenda. You know, it was also a very forgiving agenda because there was a lot of roughness in my early films because they were made for literally no budget, you know. Yeah. But they forgave <laughs> me. It was amazing how fascinated and interested the world were in these films that were exploring what was going down in South Africa. Then when apartheid ended and we transitioned into the new South Africa, there were still all kinds of social issues that needed to be dealt with. So the film that got the Oscar nomination was about a woman with HIV in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. in a village really hundreds of miles from any kind of medical help. And how does that woman deal with that thing, you know? So, you know, I've always been very socially and politically aware, you know, and those are my favorite films that I've made. They harder and harder to make because it's a truism. You don't want to go to the movies to be lectured to or see poverty or hardship. You want to go there to be entertained. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to make films that challenge, you know, the, the system. The system, yeah. But you've actually done that quite successfully, both in terms of a local context and the international context, as you know, we've pointed out here a couple times, you were nominated, your experience, you actually went over to Hollywood. <laughs> what was that like working in the sort of Hollywood game? You mentioned that difficulty that you had there during that making of that film. Up until then, I've been making the films I wanted to make. So they were my <laughs> point of view. Then suddenly you're sitting in a room with a bunch of executives, all very smart and very creative and very like on it. But suddenly it's, it's you against them. And to get your vision across is very difficult because there's so many people trying to shape your vision in order to reach their marketing target, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I was best of working with Patrick Swayze, who was the hottest star at the time. But he was fighting his own stardom. He didn't want to be the dirty dancing ghost guy. Oh. He wanted to be 
the, the alternative hero, and they didn't fit into the Disney point of view. And so there was a lot of conflict the whole time where I was trying to wow. please this and Patrick. And then before you know it, you just get caught in the middle and you end up not really having a point of view, you know. Wow. And unfortunately, it just becomes generic, you know. So you've worked with some real long list of A-listers, bro. I mean, I tell you, you have... What was it like working with Whoopi Goldberg on Serafina? Well, I mean, she was amazing because, you know, it was one of the first films to bring in an American star to play that kind of role. But she was fully committed, obviously, to, you know, the anti-apartheid movement. So she was easy to work with, you know. Mm. She was fantastic. She, like, brought her A-game because she wanted to, and there was no, like, bullshit about not having a big enough trailer or a, you know, all of that stuff. She was down and dirty in the dirt with us, dancing in those streets. It was amazing to watch, you know, it was a privilege. It was amazing to watch. I loved that film. It was joyous, and Whoopi certainly brought her A-game, as you said. And a book that I had read back in college that you made, Cry the Beloved Country, it was wow. really phenomenal. And that whole story is one of the reasons I think the world became more familiar with the implications of apartheid in South Africa. What was it like working with such great actors like James Earl Jones? And Well, again, it was a very interesting film. And, you know, the thing about the Alan Payton classic is that it's timeless and it goes beyond just like politics even. It, it goes to humanity. It goes into the soul, you know. So we made that film as South Africa was transitioning because we thought it would be a great healing balm kind of movie just to have a little glimpse into each other's lives and see that there was pain and hurt and destruction on both sides. Yeah. And it's all about the humanity that shines through. So it was fascinating to explore that humanity at that time in South Africa. And again, it caught on in South Africa. It didn't catch on in the world. You know, we thought it would do better, but it really did well in South Africa and it's still shown on television every year. And it just seems to get more powerful as the years go by. So, you know, it was a great film to make. It was a beautiful film to make. Well, those kinds of films, I think, do set the conversation in a direction. You know, at Exploration Films, we spend a lot of time talking to filmmakers, artists, directors, producers who are engaged in really cultural conversations. And I think that's that's one of the unique things about talking with directors and filmmakers who are not just interested in, I guess, the entertainment buck, but really going after some message that can be really culture shaping and culture affecting. Do you find that you look for projects that have that dimension in them? Well, you know, like kind of back in the day, it was kind of easier. You know, I mean, cinema has changed radically. I mean, cinema is still exploring these, you know, important ideas, but much less so. It's much more entertainment driven at the moment. So the trick is to find the one that can balance, you know, like kind of both agendas mm. and, you know, hard to find you know but i mean if you can do that successfully it's wonderful so you can it can be entertaining but at the same time it can be a powerful social commentary so for a recent example let's take last year's roma which won the won the oscar is that it's a very interesting film because it's entertaining it's beautifully made beautifully acted but at the same time it's got a powerful hidden message in there about social classes and you know the bourgeois versus the servant blah 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 you know so those are the cool things to find if you can find that kind of movie it's a winner but it's getting harder to finance those films getting harder to finance those films do you feel that's the case that there are fewer and fewer studios uh, willing to risk you know, the sort of profit motive for a story that can potentially be on the edge that way. Yeah, well, you take the film that won the Oscar the previous year, I think it was Moonlighting, or maybe it was the year before even. I mean, that film took eight years to make, and it only cost two and a half million dollars, and ended up winning the Oscar and making a whole bunch of money, but it took him eight years to convince someone to make that movie. Come on! I mean, that film should have been made eight years ago, and then we would be eight years ahead of the game, you know? So, but but there are some amazing people out there trying to do amazing stuff in terms of producers and money people. So it just got to get to the right person with the right project and you can make your film. What are some of your favorite films? I mean, you, you might being in the industry. I, sometimes that may, that may sound like, you know, like a chef just wants to have a pizza instead of a full blown yeah. French meal. But <laughs> what, what are some of your films? That you love. No, well, look, I'm a movie brat. I just love movies so much. I mean, I was watching an interview, funny enough, with, with Martin Scorsese kind of yesterday, we were talking about The Irishman, and the guy was saying, well, you know, about movies. And he says, well, he spent most of his, 
luck of his life in movie theaters because he's a movie brat. He likes everything. So, look, I grew up in the 70s, you know what I mean, when I was 16, 17. So I grew up with all those seminal 70s films like Taxi Driver. Mm. So those are still my favorite films. And whenever I'm feeling low about the state of cinema now, I will go and watch Taxi Driver or Marathon Man or The French Connection or even The Exorcist to see really, really solid, beautiful filmmaking. Because those film directors were on it, man. The Godfather. Indeed. Clips now. You can't, you can't beat those films, man. They are incredible. Well, I think you and I share a common generation because those are some of my favorite films, too. They're so solid. They're so expertly directed. They're so well thought out. There's so much subtext loaded into all of those films. It's not just about one superficial thing that goes in the one ear and out the other. Hey, I like the Marvel films as well. They're wonderful. I mean, fantastic, you know. But even some of the more serious-minded films, they just don't penetrate to the level where they should, you know. Yeah. I think that's always the trade-off, right? I think in some ways Marvel tried to get a little bit deeper in some of their themes about loss and about relationships and things like that. And not just, you know, explosions, mesmerizing people, but, you know, even still you're trying to find the balance, I think, between really, really good story and a story that's widely engaged because you can tell the best story, but if no one ever reads it or hears it or sees it, it's kind of missed the point, right? You have to sort of balance exactly. that excellence. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Look, I think a film like Avengers Endgame, the last one I saw, was very moving. She was, how does a superhero make you cry? But it did make you cry. It did. Because it is loaded. So, you know, if Martin Scorsese, because I know there's a whole debate raging about this, had seen that film, he might have been, I think, suitably impressed and thought, oh, my goodness, it's not just someone being thrown through a building. You know what I mean? It's much deeper than that, you know? Yeah, yeah, indeed. And even the artificially, overtly artificial things can be used by a good filmmaker to convey something that in our human experience we could never do physically, but it yeah. kind of represents something where, that somebody may be able to re- be required to do superhuman things emotionally or psychologically. So, uh, Absolutely. And then I think a great example of like marrying the two is a film like The Joker, where it's just this extreme character study that is just very disturbing but it mm. gives you an insight to where our culture's at the superficial weirdo culture you know what i mean you know yeah, yeah. The, anyway very very much a film that will be talked about for some time i think on that level let's talk a bit about the furnace which is the exploration films distribution of that film and a very very fascinating subject Maybe you could recap from your perspective what the storyline is, and then we can delve into some of the aspects, I think, of that story itself. Yeah, well, it's just about a woman. She's just gotten married, like been only married for a couple of days. They're going on honeymoon. They, they like runners. You know, there's a whole running cult in the world. So it was interesting reading about runners when I was doing research. They are fanatical. Them and cyclists are weirdos. Um, <laughs> so, he, so like he gets killed on Christmas night, and it's just before they're due to come to South Africa to run this, this big race called the Furnace, where you run through the African wilderness alongside animals and heat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he's killed in the accident, and she's left with a single lung and like virtually a cripple. And it's about how she, um, her road to recovery so that she can go and run the race in memory of her dead husband, you know? And along the way, she meets an African doctor who was exiled in America, but could never practice being a physician because he doesn't have the American qualification for that. And how he helps her on this journey back to Africa and to run the race. And, you know, she completes. And while she's running the race, she goes through a series of trials and tribulations in which she even sees an angel that appears to her and helps her. So it's got some kind of spiritual meaning. So the way I filmed it, even the way I filmed the landscape, I try to give it a lot of spiritual subtext. Sure. Sure. I, it just brought, as we were talking earlier before the podcast, even I, I've spent so many happy hours in the South African bush and in so many places that the film itself evoked in my heart. I really did enjoy the film. It had that runner culture, athletic vibe. You could, well, that's a lot into yeah yeah and it was really great but it was also i think a film that dealt not tangentially but really directly on some very very important themes uh, much the way some of your earlier films have done as well you know i was struck of course you mentioned the spirituality i think there is a transcendent spirituality throughout the whole film of the power of the human spirit the capacity for forgiveness and forgiveness of oneself as well 
And of course, I think you really handled very, very well the character that is the angel on the run. And I think the implications of that for all of us is, hey, maybe all of our lives are in a sense a furnace. And we are all faced with these spiritual and emotional and psychological and even physical challenges. How do we deal with them and how do we overcome those? Yeah, no, no, well, I think that's all loaded in there. I mean, the furnace isn't an actual race. There isn't a precise race like that. There are races through the African wilderness where you do run amongst animals, et cetera, et cetera. But it is more, I guess, metaphorical than it is literal. You know what I mean? You know? And I have some very dear South African friends who've run the Two Oceans Marathon there in yeah. Cape Town. And, you know, I mentioned this furnace to them and they're like, well, I don't know that race. And I'm like, OK, maybe <laughs> I looked a little bit more, but but it has the same sort of energy that people who are looking to process in the runner world. You know, sometimes people get in there and they are literally using running as their therapy, as their ability to process some of these things. Luthuli Delamini, I cannot pronounce his name well, but he plays the character of Coffin. And tell me a little bit about working with him. He seems to have a bright future ahead. He was really tremendous. Yeah, no, he was fantastic. It was my first film with him. I'd always wanted to make a film with him, and he really blew me away. His name's, his name's Latuli Chlamini, you know? Latuli. He's a wonderful actor. Yeah, he's been living in South Africa a long while. He's from England, so he's half South African, half English, you know? Oh. There's a depth to him that is, is amazing. You know, you've either got it or you don't have it, and he's got it in the oodles. You know, you can just film his eyes and they say a million words. You know, he's that kind of guy, you know. Yeah. And I think without the film, it would have been a lesser movie. So I was very happy to have worked with him and that he brought, you know, like what he brought to it, the humanity he brought to it. Was great, you know. Zilly was really a central character for me as I saw through his lens, very gracious lens related to his time in America and the limitations that this really brilliant man had come to terms with. In the directing process, a film like this, do you talk about bringing those sorts of subtle undertones to the character out into the performance? Yes, you try and load it with the subtext. The subtext is everything. It's about what's underneath what's happening in front of you. So if you can communicate that to your actor, it helps so much. You know. But I think he also he understood it intuitively, as did Jamie. She could see in there the deeper spiritual thing we were going for. I mean, it's a big word, you know. I mean, and I mean hard to achieve because she was, you know. But yeah, so, you know, they've understood that instinctively. And I just managed to... to, to like guide them along by putting them in the right shot, the right compass, you know, the right setting, the right, you know. Well, and you know, Jamie Bernadette was uh, phenomenal as well in the film, really a, a very beautiful and compelling character whose own challenges she overcomes very, very well. I think one of right. the biggest challenges early on is the role her parents sort of play as sort of those characters that are sort of locked in their bigotry and their, and their own racism. How did you yeah. look at taking on that theme in this film? Well, you see, again, I mean, that's all part of the subtext, and that's kind of interesting that you're perceiving that, you, you know, talking to me now. And I think, because, I mean, that's built in there to have those kind of implications. So, you know, I mean, it's a bit of gentle racism. It's not deep racism, but, you know, racism is in all of us. It just is. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that comes with the territory of being a human being, no matter where you live. You know, you're just going to be prejudice, you know what I mean? You know, if you're an Italian in the, you know, it, 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 it's such a thing that we have to deal with every day. So I thought it was quite cute the way she goes against her parents and just says, you know, really mom, witch doctors, all that stuff, you know? Exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know? Exactly. Well, it's a great way to address a current cultural conversation that in far too many contexts is all about confrontation and all about anger. And this yeah. is about struggle, yes, and this is about yeah. overcoming yeah. some real obstacles, but it's done with such good humor and such uh, inspirational character. I think oh, Jamie yeah. does an excellent job with that, really does. Like she does. You know, there's nothing better than as a director when you work with actors who are committed. And once I started working with her, I was just amazed and fascinated by how committed she was, you know. And that is always for me fascinating about the mystery of actors, uh, is how much commitment they bring to it. And 
you know, I've worked with a lot of actors now, a lot of them, you know, and there was a guy called Robert Patrick I once worked with, and it was on a, on a simple little HBO thriller where he played some kind of Alaskan tracker who comes to find the killer of his sister in San Francisco. And I was just amazed at the depths of research he had done into trackers in Alaska, the way he had built up his backstory. And, and I thought, what? I mean, he doesn't burden you with that, but he is the actor. It's behind his eyes when he's acting the scene, yeah. and you can feel it instinctively, and the camera knows that something deeper is working there. And that was the same with Jamie and, like, kind of Latuli. They were both generating that other thing. You know, there's nothing worse than the actor who thinks he's, his backstory is more important than the top story, and it's always everything from that point of view. They can drive you insane. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah, but, it's like, but wait, what's my yeah. motivation? <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, yeah, it's yeah, I mean, great. Person, but it's the truth, you know. <laughs> and that can just drive you crazy. Look, I mean, one as a director must always be open to all of those suggestions because that's what you do. You're the conduit. You're the first member of the audience. So it flows through you and you mustn't shut yourself off to that. A lot of first time or, you know, directors do shut down that. And it's, I used to do that. I used to shut out the actor completely. But now I understand they're the most important person because they're speaking to the you, the audience. Yeah. You know? And, you know, so many of the great actors will point to their directors as giving them the opportunity to have that messaging to the culture. You know, the synergy is really powerful. And, you know, we never know the impact that some of these things are going to have. I mean, that's one thing that must be extremely interesting to consider for you as a director. Sometimes you make your art. And yeah. if you're a visual artist or you're a performance artist, you can actually see how this happens in front of you you can go to the museum and see your or the gallery and see your artwork displayed and you can see what people's impact are. It's very difficult for an independent film producer and film director like yourself, I'm sure to imagine someone sitting in front of Netflix or in front of their streaming service and watching your film or yeah. even in a theater and, and yeah. recognize the impact. So it's got to be a little bit of a hope and a prayer for yourself too. <laughs> like we're sending this out there and I hope it touches someone. That's the one, man, you know, and I mean, if it means the same people, that's cool, you know, yeah. same with that you just done. Yeah. You know, would you well, just I do think you should get a contract. This is my own career advice to you. Um, you should get a contract with the South African Film Tourism Board because you have a beautiful, beautiful setting for the film, The Furnace, and all of your films, really, that embrace issues within the South African context really just do a heck of a job promoting yeah. the beauty and the culture and the people of South Africa. It's well yeah. done, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And now, I want to bring on the star of The Furnace, Jamie Bernadette. Jamie, thanks for coming on the Exploration Films podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, it's something of a privilege. We mostly get the chance to talk to uh, directors and sometimes producers, sometimes the people behind the films, but sometimes it's really great to talk to someone who's in front of the camera, someone whose career and work has been in that way. So uh, how long have you been in, uh, in the film industry? Uh, I think about 13 years now. Wow. What did you start at, like four? Did you? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, I started right after high school. Very good. Well, um, so getting involved in a film like this, just so people know, The Furnace is an incredibly dramatic story. I won't give away any of the plot line because I know that's a horrible giveaway when you do, but it's a tremendous story that encompasses so many really deep and moving themes that takes place largely in Africa and with the dramatic storyline that I'm really glad to say that Jamie you've given a really stellar performance but what was it like to work with Daryl Root now Daryl's Academy Award nominated couple different films Serafina Cry the Beloved Country Yesterday incredible director from South Africa what was it like to work with him oh man it was phenomenal like he's so inspiring and he has so much energy on set and he's positive but he's honest you know, and that's important for a director to tell you honestly how it's looking, how each scene is going. And 
Oh man, he is just amazing. And honestly, he changed my life. He made me really? believe in myself, whereas before I didn't really at all. Wow. In some ways that may even mirror the personal story of the film. <laughs> Truly, right? So how did you get involved in the project? Well, Sam, uh, one of the producers on the film, contacted me. He had seen a movie that I was in. I'm not even sure which movie it was. <laughs> and he's like, I don't remember which one it was when we talked about it later. And I don't know. He said, this is our lead. And wow. yeah, and then we had a Skype conversation maybe for like 10 minutes. And that was it. Wow. So what, it, maybe uh, listeners can hear the furnace and go, what is that? What actually is the furnace? The furnace is a race. It's a mega marathon across the African bush. So you're running with a lot of animals. They call it the big five, like rhinos and elephants and cheetahs. <laughs> and you know, Worse than running um, in the streets of L.A.? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> And yeah, that's what it is. And it's really hot, of course. So yeah, so we're called the furnace. Whereabouts in Africa were you shot? It was absolutely beautiful photography and cinematography. Oh, thanks. Yeah, outside of Johannesburg, well outside of it. We shot on um, some farms and things like that where there was a lot of open bush. Yeah. Well, it actually is very compelling from a visual standpoint as well. I'm... I know many of the people who watch it will never have been to Africa, but for myself, I've had a chance to be there in a lot of different experiences and times in the bush. And it, it just had that feel, that resonance, you know, that sort of hot, dry, soul-crushing endurance that's required to do a race like that. Are you a runner in mm -hmm. real life, in the life that you have? Yeah, I run recreationally. I mean, I don't compete. So, but I do run and exercise and things like that. So, but was I prepared completely for the film? <laughs> Not to the extent that I ran. I mean, so, there were days that I would run all day for literally 12 hours. I mean, stopping in between, but you're not prepared for that. If you run even a couple hours a day, you're not prepared for that. So <laughs> so some of those scenes of exhaustion, they were real. You were really yeah. exhausted. Yeah, for sure. I was sore. I mean, yeah. You're not going to go away, are you? So you help me? You're going to need more than just a trainer to succeed in all of this. No, oh, no, la lela. Your breathing has improved remarkably over the last year. Strength isn't an issue. You're obviously as strong as an ox. Ox. Ah, and, and as stubborn as one as well. But the African bush isn't to be trifled with. You know, it'll get into your head. Pick you up, spin you around, chew you up, and spit you out. It'll snuff your life out in a split second. You're going to have to acquire a whole new set of survival skills. You're going to have to learn how to survive on 20 hours of sleep in a week of running. You're going to have to learn how to balance your water intake with the amount of weight you can carry. You're going to have to get through this on 25,000 calories just, just to survive. And then, of course, there's the heat getting lost, eaten by a wild animal in the bush. I mean, do you really, really want this? I mean, are you ready for this? That sounds awesome. Well, your performance was great. And, and it, you know, it, it has some other cast members that I think are fantastic. The African actor, Luthuli Dalami. I'm, yeah. I hope I'm saying that correct. I will go with what you call him in the movie, Coffin. Yeah, yeah, Luthuli, <laughs> uh, who, yeah. Who, who plays the doctor. He was absolutely compelling as well. How is it to work with him? Oh, man, he's fantastic. Isn't he just so natural without even trying? It's just, he's just, gosh, he's so talented. And yes, a wonderful person too. Some of those scenes where you're first encountering him and his situation, I won't go into too many details, but let's just say he is 
way out of place in American society because of his capacities and his backgrounds. And then he meets your character and there's a real bond there. How did you guys explore that and explore the nuances of what your character was going through versus what he was able to relate to in his experience? I mean, for me, if my character doesn't know him before we film, I would like to go into the scenes not knowing him, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah, so explain it that a little bit. Yeah, it wasn't like Latuli and I didn't sit down and discuss at length our characters. Mm -hmm. We more just did each scene in present time and got to know each other through the film. And you know what I mean? It's almost good not to know too much and learn it as the character's learning it in the script, if that makes sense. Fascinating. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> so, so you actually let the film be the place where you're learning this, just like the character is learning this, and that helps inform your performance. Right. Fantastic. That's fabulous. Even before I met her, I buried her husband. That's if you can call being married to a man for two days your husband. She never noticed me. She was too bent over with that oxygen mask of hers to notice anything. I hate you! So... Jamie, I would love to know a little bit more, and I know everybody listening would love to know a little bit more about where you come from and your background, and how did you get into the film industry in the first place? Uh, well, I come from a town called Kankakee, Illinois. It's about 70 miles south of Chicago. The youngest of nine. I grew up in a really big family. Wow. And yeah, I was the only one interested in acting out of my family. I was doing theater as a child and in high school, and I would watch movies and act them out. and. And so then, yeah, I came out to Los Angeles and started acting professionally. Fantastic. Your character experiences something in this film. I won't give it away either, but an incredible sense of loss and such as well. How did you position yourself for portraying that? I mean, I think the loss that she experiences is almost unfathomable to most people, but yet I'm sure it happens every day to someone. How did you prepare yourself for that? I think that's life preparation, if that makes sense. Like we've all experienced some sort of loss in our lives by the time you get to a certain age, you know. So, but yeah, you asked a million dollar question. I mean, I had the producers asking me, the director asking me, but I never get into it too much, uh, what I'm pulling from or, but I am pulling from things, you know, yeah. from the past to bring out that emotion. Well, it's there and it comes out so strongly certainly it sets the tone for the rest of the film about your journey and i don't just mean the journey to africa i mean the journey through healing and through all of that and there's some parts of the healing thing as well that i felt like were so strongly delivered have you ever had to heal from something that was significant like that or have you always been a healthy character <laughs> no no i've had to do a lot of healing in my life but yeah it's definitely stuff that i use in my acting just kind of probably a form of therapy for me to be well, honest. <laughs> I've heard that to before. To be honest. I've heard that before. And it's absolutely something that comes through very, very strongly. Your your ability to grab onto that hope and determination in the process of healing is extremely important to the story. And, and I think you did a fantastic job about that. Courage does not always rule. Sometimes... Courage is a quiet voice at the end of the day, saying I will try again tomorrow, and the tomorrow after that tomorrow if necessary. And the, and the other dramatic part that I really wanted to touch into is the idea of faith. You know, you have a scene, again, I won't give this away, you have several scenes with a character that, I think I can give it away, is like an angel or is like someone who's speaking from a different place into your life to give you faith and encouragement along the way. What role does faith play in helping you get through some of those difficult things? Oh, well, I mean, it's huge in the film, this idea of faith and believing in God. You know, she loses touch with that when she loses everything, as we'll often feel bitter, you know, when we go through huge losses in life and setbacks. Um, 
one of the themes in the film is is about letting go of that bitterness and that anger and believing again in in God or whatever spirituality you believe in. So, well, it certainly came through. And one thing I would say, you know, a furnace—that's usually somewhere you're refining something. You're either you're burning and you're burning away things Mm. that are not pure. And Mm. I think what happens in this film is you see this character, your character, go through this burning away of these things that are in her life. And she comes to the end of the process refined, not Mm -hmm. refined in sort of a mannered way, but in the process, like you refine gold or you refine silver and it comes out pure. That's a really powerful statement about faith. And I think, again, your character and the way the circumstances happen in the film really brings that out. So I wanted to say good work. Very, very excited to see the impact this film has. Running is the loneliest sport. It's just you, the road, and God. You fight against the road, the elements, but mostly against yourself. (sighs) It is here that the true strength is shown. When, and against all odds, you push yourself farther than even you thought you could go. Did you actually film around some of the animals that were in the film as you Mm -hmm. were running? Oh, yeah. How'd that make Mm -hmm. you feel? Were you like a little vulnerable in that context? Um... I mean, I was fine around the cheetahs and the elephants. The hyenas, I mean, I was in the tree. They can't climb trees, and they had me actually strapped into that tree. So if I fell, you know. You weren't going to get mauled by hyenas. Exactly. (laughs) So I don't know. I think I'm a pretty calm person anyway, and I think animals can feel that. Like dogs usually like me. Children usually like me. So I don't know. The the animals were fine around me, and I didn't feel fear. I do remember one time, though, when they were doing aerial shots. They were in a helicopter, Mm. and I was running through the African bush, which was this farm, and they had a ton of animals, you know, in that area, which could be dangerous. And it was me and one other person on the ground, and I thought, man, if... If they attack now, <laughs> what's anybody going to do, you know? Yeah, so exactly. I did, I did have that thought, but yeah. Well, I, it crossed my mind. This is an amazing race. It goes on for days, and you're running through wild Africa. And most of the predators in Africa are triggered by motion. They're triggered by an animal running. They're going to run after that animal. And I wondered... You know, what What must, I'm sorry to let you know that right now. Maybe that was a surprise while you, they didn't tell you that while you were filming? No. Okay, well. But it uh, makes sense. <laughs> that's funny. I mean, yeah, you feel comfortable around the cheetah until you realize it runs at 55 miles an hour. It can run you down. In yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I was more worried about the crocodiles, I remember. Oh, Because right. I, I, yeah. yeah, I had to lay down by this river and I was like, I don't know about this, you guys. Because, <laughs> you know, crocodiles are known. They just come out, grab you and drag you off. And there you the go. Lake. It's in seconds. And right. And I'm laying there vulnerable by myself because we're doing a shot. So they stood around like on the perimeter after yeah. that, like but some far of the enough crew, away. which was really sweet. Like, I don't think he's going to eat all of you, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a crocodile I don't trust and at And I all. have prehistoric brains. You can't reason <laughs> with a crocodile. They say for all humans to come to Africa is for them to come home. Mary must have felt that better than most. Alone in the wilderness, surrounded by the ancient bush and its wild animals. It's a beautiful story of those signposts of faith throughout someone's life. Um, And again, when I was done watching the film, I thought back about a number of the different scenes that were relevant to that 
storyline and it was really quite moving and i'm confident that anyone who watches this film will have the same reaction that whatever challenges we face whatever things that we're engaging with god is there faith is there to help us get through it and mm -hmm. by getting through it we achieve a certain kind of victory don't you think yeah yeah absolutely then the next time we're hit with something in in life we're stronger you know you can only go through so much but when you go through something again and you're just much better at it you know that makes sense no for sure so do yeah. you do you have like a thought on what the big message of a film like the furnace is all about what's the big thing that you'd think somebody would take away from a film like that i feel like it's going to help people who have suffered great losses in life great setbacks i feel like it can help them heal mm. as films can i mean they can be very powerful i've heard of people watching films over and over and over again because they've helped them heal so i hope it really does touch people who are suffering any kind of suffering whether it be the loss of a a loved one or just a breakup in a relationship or I mean I think it can be very powerful to help someone come out of that loss well I agree that's a powerful way to focus people's attention on this film I, I really hope it gets all the attention it deserves it's an incredible inspirational film that's a wrap You've been listening to the Exploration Films Podcast, explorationfilms.com.